Hi, everyone. It's uh, Roxanne Durhodge of Authentic Living with Roxanne. Thanks for tuning in again this week. Uh, today, I have a special guest, David Richards, with us today. Hi, David. How are you today? Doing great, Roxanne. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, thanks for being on. So David brings um, you know, a combination of uh, expertise that I thought would be valuable for us to uh, get into. He's a, a, a business a professional coach, a life coach, yoga instructor, and an international bestseller. He just released his second book, The Lighthouse Keeper, on March 31st. So hot off the press, and he's in the process of, of uh, writing his third one. And he spe he's a speaker on self-development. He spent his early childhood living in various parts of the U.S. At present, he lives in North Carolina. And three years living on the island of, of Okinawa in Japan. Fascinating. After graduating for, with a bachelor's degree in English, so writing comes naturally, I would think. Um, and he, he was commissioned an officer in the Marines. Down to earth, insightful, and sometimes silly, which we'd like to hear this. We'd like to experience the silly. He blends elements of yoga with quantum physics uh, to bring the esoteric together with the practical. In doing this, David helps people find their freedom by turning their great mess into their greatness. And I would say that a lot of people have a lot of mess um, in their minds. Would, would you agree with that statement, David? Not to, to bring it down to brass tacks, but really there's a lot of messiness in our minds. Oh, for sure. We live, you know, one of the things I think, Roxanne, we've done with, with technology today, and I think the statistics I've heard, you know, there are three and a half billion cell phones on the planet. Mm -hmm. And on average, people check their cell phones 85 times a day. So when you step back and really assess what we've done, well, we've habitualized distractions. We've made distraction a habit. So we go from this and then we do this and then we do this. And, and then we wonder at the end of the day, well, I didn't get the stuff done. I really wanted to get done. Or why do I, why don't I have the sense of fulfillment that I really want in life? And it's because we're distracted all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you're so right. Uh, you know, I think the norm now for the mind is that most people are, are quite comfortable with distraction, but when we stop the distraction to get into quiet, like, like we've been forced to in this uncertain time, um, most of us have been, you know, we're working from home. I'm sure you probably travel a lot like I do, and, but you work from home, but now having to stop and be in that space, a lot of people are, are kind of going a bit stir crazy with, okay, I, I can only distract myself so much. I need to go out. I need to, you know, go visit people and all those things that we've kind of filled our time with. And now what I'm hearing with a lot of people that I'm consulting with is I don't know what to do with myself because I need to fill things up. You know, I need to fill my time and really the opposite I think is being dictated of right now is just to try to get comfortable. Um, but people aren't comfortable with that stillness. They really aren't. And it's, you know, and, and you said something that's key. We're so used to the, the, the currency by which we live our lives is by what we do. We all evaluate our lives on what we do. And, and we start the day again with technology. Most of us, the first thing we do is go back to our identity, which is right here. What do I have to look at? What do I have to, Oh, I got calls today. Oh my gosh, this person texted me. Oh, that's so funny. Mm -hmm. And, and now that we've had this global sort of reset, mm -hmm. um, I think people are unsettled because they don't know what to do. And the reality is, if you step back from that, we become a slave to what we do and not, and not, not just work or play, but instead of thinking about what we do, why don't we think about who we are? If I think about who I am and who I wanna be, then I start to get, then I feel attraction in my life. I'm like, well, if I, if I want to be, if I want to be a better father, or if I want to be a better friend or a better partner or whatever, what does that look like? Who, what is the characteristics of that person? And when you start to visualize what that person looks like and you understand who you are, then you can build a path of what you need to do to get from where you are to who you want to become. Because we have such a, obsession with doing things and trying to outdo one another and comparing ourselves to each other we get lost on that and you know i think that's what makes i was i was playing with words the other night while i was working on my next book and i think that's what makes the past tense and the present tense our doing is what makes the past tense and our doing what's make is what makes the present tense forget about you know do does did or whatever the 
the syntax is, but our doing is what makes things tense because it creates tension. Um, so I think we need to focus more on who we are and less on what we do. So this whole concept of obviously um, doing is, is the Western philosophy of life, right? Like it's something that, you know, I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago, which, you know, I, I even though I grew up with Western norms, the, the, our, the culture was a bit different, you know, and I, I, you know, I came here when I was 16 to Canada to pursue, to go to university. So when I go back to the island, for instance, I'll give you an example, David, I, I often go back um, and my friends that they'll greet me and they're, you know, often most of them are professionals and they will say to me, where are you? And I'm like, what do you mean? Where am I? And I, and I'll, and I'll go, well, I'm the, I'm the Roxanne that, you know, and they go, no, 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 no. I, I, I can't feel you. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, mind you, I know I would left developmentally. I was 16. I was, a, a, you know, a young teenager compared to now, but after a while, I started to get a sense of what um, they meant because what happens is, and you know, obviously North American tempo compared to the islands, it's literally like I feel like when I step off that plane and I put my feet on the ground of kind of the motherland for me, something almost neutralizes in me where I go back to that tempo of life, which I if you were to ask me without that observation, I would say, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm the same person. I'm, right. I'm, I'm just as chill as they come, but I'm not anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, you're right. And it's, it's an interesting balance. Right. And that's why I think, you know, as Americans or even North Americans, we'd like to go to the Caribbean to vacation. Yeah. Not only is it because the weather's so great, but because mindset is so different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and because if we have the courage to leave our cell phone in the hotel room or in the villa or wherever we're staying and actually experience things it's so refreshing because we take so little time to do it here in North America and mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting because I think this like I said this global reset has given people reason to pause and to look at well gosh how can I come out of this better like, how can I be better than I have been? And so often, Roxanne, I think that's a journey that most of us externalize, you know, and it, and it comes down to, I see someone who's successful. I'm going to do what they do. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get what they have and I'll be like them. Mm -hmm. And that's an external journey. And it never works because we're looking at a person at a moment in time and then we're trying to anchor ourselves on that moment in time, even though that moment is passing us by and we're st still. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you kind of step back and say, okay, again, who do I want to be? And you start to think, how does that person think? How does that person feel? What do they think about? What are their habits? Then it becomes clear, oh, well then these are the things I need to do mm -hmm. in order to have the person, the things that that person has and it just spells it out so much more beautifully. And you know, the, the beauty of, I think, being present with someone is so often when we talk to people, we're waiting for our turn to talk. Mm -hmm. So when they're talking, we're not listening, we're not experiencing them. We're internally processing, okay, what do I need to say? Oh, no. and it's kind of a fear-based reaction. So we're missing out on what's being said and then we're trying to add something because we have an opinion that we feel is either better, different, or, you know, it's again, it's a comparison. And so we just have to get to this place, especially in Western culture, where we slow down and we mentally mm -hmm. come back to who we are and, and realize that that's the place that we need to exist from, as opposed to, I did this today, I'm doing this tomorrow, I'm doing twice of it on Saturday. Absolutely. And I think, you know, now that I think back and when I go back, um, you know, I still stay home, even though I've lived in Canada a whole lot longer than I lived in Trinidad. And what I, I what some of the, the culture and I would like to talk to you a little bit about uh, Japan, because I, I you know, I, I would love to know about that, that element of mindfulness. But um, when I, in Trinidad, what happens is, is that when you visit quite literally, because it, it, it's warm, I think some of that has to do with climate and stuff like that. You can literally go to someone's house and what happens when you, you know, and I, I grew up in a little village um, in Trinidad, it's called Diamond Village, really tiny little place where my grandparents were and stuff like that. 
So what happens every time it's a ritual for me, probably recapturing that space in my childhood is every time I go, I go visit and I never, I never really tell anybody I'm coming. But what happens is, is, you know, there's these neighbors that ended up becoming like family and I don't talk to them all the time. I always go back and visit. And what happens is uh, I've gone back with my mom, my, my dad, everybody will stop and whoever's home, they'll come out and visit. Just, wow. you know, and, and I think I would love to do that here in my little cul-de-sac, right? Except I would probably have to call ahead of time. Uh, and again, this is a cultural thing. I'd have to make sure that they had time. I'd have to make sure right. it was an okay time, blah, 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 blah. And, but in, again, it, these are one of the traditions that I, I was imbued in growing up. So I think when I go back and I just experience it, it just puts me in a, in a mindful space because everybody around me is just chilling. They're just kind of, hey, what are you doing? How's your mom? How's your dad? How are all your siblings? Right. What's new? And they're just present with me. And that right. was something that I was exposed to all the time as a child. Um, you know, so I think I understand now what my friends, they rip me about, you know, how I'm not present. I, I get what they mean. But, you know, it's kind of like that concept of, of a fish doesn't know it's wet kind of concept. <laughs> Um, and then after I, 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 I'm there for a while, I'm, I'm recalibrated down to a different level. So when you lived in Japan, um, what was that like? So you, were you a Marine uh, when you were in Japan or was that another time in your life? No, I was actually a boy. I was, uh, it was fifth grade through seventh grade. So in some ways it was fascinating because, um, Growing up, so my father was in the military, and we moved around, you know, every two, two or three years, um, and most of that was up and down the East Coast. So we'd go to okay. Virginia, then to Maryland, then back to Virginia, mm. and so then going all the way across, not just the country but the world, to Japan, yeah. and going to this place where, you know, we arrived at Naha International Airport, I think in June or July, and it was about ten thirty at night, and the plane landed, and. Um, there wasn't a terminal, there wasn't a jet bridge, so you didn't walk, you know, into this climate controlled thing. There was space, the plane landed, then you had to walk into the terminal. It was probably a 50 or 100 yard walk. And I just remember getting into the terminal and being drenched because it was so humid. Like I had never mm. experienced humidity like that. And then, you know, um, it, it was just like discovery, like, wow, there's no English signs. The mm. People all look the same and it's not how I look. So right. I'm very different. <laughs> right. And so like, in some sense, you, I learned what it was like to be a minority. Um, mm -hmm. But it was fascinating to be exposed to another culture. And it wasn't, you know, we had opportunities to travel to South Korea. We went to the Philippines. Um, but I took away from that kind of the ideas, the early elements of understanding what Bushido was, the warrior spirit, the warrior spirit, um, uh, and uh, you know, sort of having this romance with the idea of the samurai and what they represented in uh, in feudal Japan, um, and then came back after three years to start, uh, or my you know eighth grade in North Carolina, mm. um, but realized it was also you know, back then there wasn't the internet. And so we, right. we, lived, we lived on a small island on the other side of the world and everything was displaced. Um, and I always thought back, oh my gosh, what are my friends that I used to have, which now we're not friends anymore because we're not texting or anything else. What are they doing? Or what's life back in the States? And, you know, a movie would come out and it would take two or three months before it came into the, the military theaters. And I remember, you know, Empire Strikes Back came out and my brother and I were so excited to go see it. So we went to a Japanese theater because it came out like a week or two after it came out in the States. And it was in, it was English with subtitles, but it was such a treat. It was such a big deal. Mm. But I didn't, you know, in some ways I was so grateful for that experience. But also when I went back to the States, I realized that in many ways I was left behind because all my, you know, the people that I became friends with were, were doing their things, but they were doing it in the U.S. And so mm -hmm. I brought a different perspective when I came back. So let's talk a little bit about that perspective, David, and um, kind of what's, at what point, so you're obviously, you're, you've written books, you're, 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 I'm going to see that Eastern philosophy, I'm going to assume comes into your coaching and your books. What, what 
what got you um, into the field of coaching? What, when did you decide? Did you go to school? Did you go to business and decide, I want to become a coach? And, and then these influences followed after? Or how did you kind of decide that you wanted to be in this, this uh, field? Yeah, it's not, uh, it's not an easy answer. Um, I was in the Marines for 15 years and, uh, and then realized that I was kind of, I was living the script of someone else. And I think to an extent that was my dad because and it wasn't that he had pushed the military down my throat or my brother's throat, but it was just, I didn't know what else to do. Um, I, I loved English. I didn't think I could actually take, you know, become a writer or that English was a serious vocation. So um, to pay for college, I went into the military ROTC program. And after 15 years, I realized I didn't want to do that. I got out in August of 2006 and I read an article in Sports Illustrated, I believe, about NFL players using their midsection or using yoga to strengthen their core. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to give that a try. That sounds like I work out a lot. Let me give it a shot. So um, I took my first yoga class. It was a gentle class at the local mm -hmm. gym. And I thought, oh, it's not bad. Um, two days later, I took a different class, different teacher, different style of instruction, drenched in sweat. Um, and I was just, I was kind of taken aback. But then my last assignment in the military, I was working in Central America, helping some of the governments modernize their military. And so I might get 50 email a week. And when I came into corporate America, I would get 50 email in the first two hours of the day. And so I would leave work and my, my mind would just be this noise of everything to do lists and mm -hmm. agenda items and after actions and action items and everything else. And um, what I discovered when I got onto the yoga mat was it just, my mind stopped. It was mm -hmm. quiet and I didn't know, I didn't know why I just know it felt amazing. And so I, I, be I became an instructor kind of a year after my first class um, and then just through different trainings, I had instructors and I was fascinated just by how they talked. Mm. Like it wasn't, it wasn't even necessarily what they said, but just the words they used. And so I went to lunch with one of them and I said, what are you? And this was probably back in 2012. And he said, well, I'm a coach. I'm mm. like, a coach. <laughs> That's fascinating because <laughs> it was just so, because it was, they weren't telling you answers. They were, they were curious. They were curious. And because they were curious, they pulled things out of you that you didn't know were there. And it created this sense of enlightenment. So I said, I want to be a coach. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to go be a coach. And I, I did. And uh, I got certified back in 2012 and, um, and it was, it was interesting. It, you know, I, I started kind of flirting around with using it with the people that worked for me. Um, but then just kind of continued down the path and uh, fast forward to 2017, uh, I read Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. Mm -hmm. And in the first or second chapter of the book, he talks about what is your purpose in life? Mm -hmm. And I realized Roxanne, I had never asked myself that question. What is my purpose? I always asked what I wanted to do. It mm -hmm. always came back to what I wanted to do. Where did I want to go? Mm -hmm. What did I want to do? Never thinking about the consequences of if I want to go there and do this, well, who do I have to become? Because then it's like I slide into who I need to be to do that rather than this is who I am. And therefore this is who I want to become. And that's what I want to do. Um, so like I, an, from an external um, space to an internal space. Yes. That was the, okay. that was the big shift for me was finding my purpose in life. So in January of 2017, I wrote uh, my first life purpose statement. Um, I started writing my first book, Whiskey and Yoga, about finding your purpose in life. Whiskey and Yoga? Yes. Okay. Yes. That, that I want to hear more about. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, so I, I wrote about 200 pages. It was autobiographical. I got to around, actually, I got to this time of year, April, and um, looked at it. And I'm like, you know what? I, I still probably had another two or 300 pages to go. I said, no one is really going to want to read a 500 page book. Mm -hmm about someone finding their purpose in life. So I threw all that I had done away. I wrote a 10 chapter outline for a self-help book. Mm. And two months later, I, I wrote Whiskey and Yoga. It came out in October of that year. Um, international bestseller, number one in self-help on Amazon. And, uh, and it, was, it was an awakening. It was really an awakening, but it was the, the awakening that the journey is internal. And I think to tie it back, so I became, I became a certified professional coach that year. I went to a couple of Tony Robbins events that year. 
Um, but I think it was really understanding that the journey we all need to take is an internal one. And I think that's what the opportunity we pr presented with today with the pandemic is, you know, you maybe you don't finish the journey, but at least start the journey, go internal, go inside, find out who you really are and then figure out who you can become. Now, I know you say that we're in this space and I, tr I truly believe that, that we are in this space, but a lot of people aren't doing so well with the space that's being afforded to them right now. A lot of people and, uh, that I've been you know, coaching or whatever, they're trying to fill that space or you know, they're like, I, I, you know, I, uh, I talked to a, you know, a colleague the other day and, and she said to me, I, I can't do this for another month. And I'm like, what part of it can't you do? But no, she couldn't articulate to me what specifically she could do. Um, so even though I think for you, I, I completely believe that it's a time where we can really have that time. Not that you're not, people are still, some people are still working. Some people are at home um, out of work. Uh, but there's a lot more white noise with families being home for some people, those types of things. So it's more difficult. But even the people that have the capacity to slow, they're not doing so well with slowing down. It's yeah, it's an interesting dilemma. And I think part of the reason is, and I've heard I've heard this with people I've talked to, and it, it's it's no it's so casual how we we've surrendered a lot of power to the words we use without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I'll hear people say, Well, when things get back to normal, and I'll say, Yeah, they're not there isn't normal. This is normal. This is yeah. normal now. And I think that's part of the struggle is people have, okay, it's like holding your breath mm -hmm. and a month and a half ago, we were breathing normally and then yeah. we had to hold our breath. And so people hold their breath, waiting for it to go back to normal mm. instead of accepting this is normal right now. And the, the story that I share with people is, you know, the first 22 Christmases of my life were spent with family, um, either at our, our house or going to a grandparent's house or someone, but it was Christmas trees. It was presents under the tree. It was all the smells, the sounds, just that feeling of Christmas. And then my 23rd Christmas was spent in Mogadishu, Somalia, um, wow. which is about 50 miles away from the equator. So blistering hot right. as a Marine and um, no Christmas tree. So what I did for the Marines was I got a bunch of tent poles, just these metal poles, and I put them in the ground. And then our, our food would come in boxes that they're called MREs, meals ready to eat. And so they come in a box about um, maybe two feet long. And uh, I, cut, I cut, box, the cut the boxes up to make it look like branches of a Christmas tree. Mm. And so I put those on the pole and then I made a star for the top. And we have these little glow sticks, the you know plastic glow sticks that you break and then you shake up and they light up yeah. and they hold. And then we use those for ornaments. And so I hung those on the tree. And then instead of presents, we put all the bags of food. So the, the MREs come in this bag um, and we put those underneath so that when the Marines woke up, that was their Christmas tree. And that was normal and people, and people loved it. It was great. Mm. So today, stop just just surrender what used to be surrender february 28th to february whatever whatever it was and what does today look like who do i need to be today who can i be today in this version of normal because this is what normal is now mm -hmm. and when we come out of this whenever that is if it's tomorrow if it's two weeks if it's two months then we'll create a new normal and hopefully we'll learn that there were things that, you know, I mean, there, there were things that we did well before and things we didn't do so well. And, you know, I, I read something interesting yesterday. I heard something interesting yesterday and it said for the first time in 18 years, the United States did not have a school shooting sure. last month, last month was the first month in 18 years. So March. And in some sense, you look at that and you say, what a tragedy. What a tragedy that 18 years mm -hmm. we had a shooting every month at least. Wow. But then you look at it and say, what an opportunity. We finally broke the record, like it's over. And so what I, what I would tell people is crisis, you know, people, people talk about leading through crisis. Well, crisis is a perspective. 
you can look at today and say this is a crisis, but opportunity is a perspective too. So which perspective do you want to have? Do you want to have the perspective that the sky is falling and this is terrible? Or do you want to have the perspective of, oh my gosh, what an opportunity to, to really step back and appreciate the beauty of life, to see that you know, there are coyotes roaming the streets of San Francisco or the dolphins have come back to the can, you know, canals of Venice. Or, and you, you can know, see the top of the Himalayas, like things yeah. like, you know, like, and then I'm like, Okay, and those are the ones that I know of. I've not gone to investigate all the things that are happening in the world, but there are some kind of mind-blowing things and that are happening. And I'm thinking ecologically, what is the world showing us? You know, it is showing us that there's things that can happen that are possible, um, but we need to get regrounded to the earth. Yes, abs absolutely. I think that's huge. And I think it's, um, you know, life is a gift. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, we've lost track of the idea that we're not the only living beings on the planet. Mm -hmm. Like we've, like the, the earth itself. I mean, if you look around for trillions of miles, it doesn't look that good. Earth mm -hmm. looks pretty sweet in comparison. And I think this is a great reset, you know, and is it, you know, my, I guess my hope is that we don't go back to the normal that we were because, you know, if, if the sky is better now and the canals are cleaner and streets are cleaner and the air is cleaner. Mm -hmm. That feels pretty good. And maybe this is what peace feels like. Maybe this is what, you know, I know people are dying and it's a tragedy, but we're not making wars. Man isn't killing man, you know, with tanks and with planes and guns. And that's a pretty good thing. I, I would say, and like to also for my concept, it's not, it's knowing that the reality is yes, we, we have something going on, Yes, you need to take your certain measures to stay safe and, and do your part, but really the concept of, um, uh, you know, things like listening to people like Bruce Lipton about the biology of belief and really that the concept that really this is an opportunity and I will say to people, yes, not to negate what's happening. However, the concern is with the world is that how are we going to take this opportunity to be as healthy as we can based on what we can control at this time? And the, con and the concern that's kind of being projected is that most people are in such a panic and fear state that their, their immune system is getting constricted and compromised. And what will happen is that, unfortunately, um, because people aren't taking the opportunity to figure out what, what balance looks like for them, psychologically, emotionally, physiologically, movement, all those things, that we'll see a backdrop of, um, you know, in, increase in people being sick because people are kind of in that panic mode and, you know, holding their breath to your point versus kind of saying, okay, what, what's within my control? What can I do? Because that's all I have. Like you, like you said, all we have is control over my body, what goes into my mind and how I feel. Right. And, but unfortunately, because of when, every time you turn on the TV, um, you know, and you look, I, I know it's a bad time, but really about those limiting things that you put in and out of your system becomes key in this time. Well, and that's part of the reason why I wrote The Lighthouse Keeper, right, is because you have the choice of what you focus on. And I, I love Bruce Lipton. That's such a great book. You know, I, I, I mean, I was staggered to think when I read that, I think he talks about the example that someone who is bulimic can think themselves to death. Yep. And I mean, the implications of that are staggering. So it's like, what, what, what are you making of your reality? What do you really believe Mm -hmm. And if you really believe that this is a horrible time, the worst time in our history, then, I mean, just think about what you're doing to your psychology, to your physiology. Mm -hmm. And if you, instead, if you choose to say, you know what, this is, this is the greatest opportunity in history. Mm -hmm. We can come together in a way we've never come together before. We can be something more than we were ever before. Oh my gosh, what a great opportunity. It's exciting. Like it's exciting to think that we can come out of this better than we were when we went into it. You know, and I, the things that I see like are things like um, how much people are recognizing what connection is about, right? Yep. Like, or so, you know, and we see that we maybe we're not as focused on that, but when you see like grandparents not being able to see their grandchildren or people having you know, little motorcades with birthday parties, like 
I think it's, it's recalibrating us around the need for connection because I think you are so busy. I mean, all of us are very busy that that sometimes gets slighted, but I think going without the ability to connect in person, obviously you could do it virtually, but we're, we're, I think for the first time in my life anyway, that I'm realizing, I'm, I mean, I'm an extrovert and I connect and I, I, you know, do those things, but the vitalness of connection for me as a mammal is being heightened. So the people that, I'm my, uh, that are in my love, I, I will say I'm loving them up even more, even though I'm not seeing them potentially. I see the value of what they bring. And, I've, and I feel so grateful for the people that I have in my life, even though I'm physically not seeing them. You know, so, I, you know, I wonder if people are starting to reflect on that as much versus saying it as, oh, my goodness, I, 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 you know, this is so horrible. I can't see the people I love. Yeah, I, I think there is. I mean, it feels like it feels like there. Uh, I, I just finished Dr. Joe Dispenza's Becoming Supernatural. OK. And, and uh, what a phenomenal book. And I realize it's so interesting because I, I picked up the book. I think it came out in 16 or 17. Mm-hmm. And I picked up the book a couple years back and I wasn't ready for it. Like I started to read it and I'm like, nope. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I started it maybe back in February or early March. And, and even at the end of the book, he says, you know, I think we're on the verge of this awakening. And mm-hmm. he's absolutely right because I think we sometimes think about what, what, what does the evolution look like at this stage? Mm-hmm. What does evolution really look like? And I think it's not that we're not going to evolve into Martians with, you know, big heads and long limbs and fingers that are 12 inches long or anything like that. But I think we're going to start to realize that we're all the same. And even through our diversity, we keep diversifying. It's, it's life, but life keeps diversifying to show you, despite the differences, we're all the same. And that's the great opportunity of this pandemic, right? Is Mm -hmm. this pandemic doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care if you're, what your gender is. It doesn't care what your race is. It doesn't care your religion. It doesn't care where you live. It doesn't care about any of those things. And so what's the, what are we left with? Oh my gosh, I'm the same as you. We are the same Mm -hmm. being on the same planet. Despite all the differences we have, Mm -hmm. when we come right down to it, we're the same being. Mm-hmm. And that's what evolution looks like. So it's building these communities. And I think on the outskirts of this, I think if you look forward, families are going to be different. Like families are going to be different. How we raise children is going to be different because we're going to see we can do things smarter. We can do things better than we've done them. And we can be, and that's how we become better. And part of that, I think Roxanne too, I think evolution also requires you have to look at or question some of the beliefs that you've held sacred for so long and whether that's religious, whether that's cultural, whether that's economic, but you have to look at the things that have been sacrosanct and say, okay, is this still true? Is this what's guiding us into the future? Because maybe this isn't working so well. And I think to your point, that whole reset, and and I've been uh, uh, listening to a lot of Greg Braden lately too. So that whole concept about energy, right? Like, I mean, you know, what, what are we recalibrating to? And where do we need to get to be able to reset things so we can kind of accept to your point, it's, this is the new, whatever this is, this is the new no, normal. And what are, what are the things that we can gain to walk away with from this time? Now, tell me a little bit about the book, because I, it sounds like um, the journey of the lighthouse, it would be something that it sounds fascinating. So tell me about it. And, you know, um, obviously, um, you know, you're into consciousness and, and mindfulness and energy and quantum physics. So what, how, what is the journey of the, uh, in the book? Yeah. So the, the journey is uh, there's a young man, Sam, who's a chicken farmer on his father's farm and his, uh, you kind of enter into his world and it just feels like groundhog day. He's, he's waking up every day. They're doing chickens. They're doing the chores. Their mother, his mother died. Um, and he just gets to a point where he's like, this isn't what I want. This isn't who I am. I, I don't want to, I don't want to see my life script played out in front of me and, and just play the role that I'm supposed to play. And so uh, he, he wrestles with how to approach his father with it. And then finally uh, he takes the step and he goes to the lighthouse and he, he meets the lighthouse keeper, this old man, Armand, who's very strange and that he talks to himself and, um, and while he's there, he, he starts to learn about himself. And I talk about, uh, you know, the habits of distraction. 
Um, and then he goes on a journey into his mind. And the only way that he can come out is to learn how to master his mind. And um, he visits different oceans in the mind. And the premise of the book really is that our, our mind is an ocean. And that's where all our memories are. That's where everyone we've ever met, that's where they all reside. And then our awareness is a lighthouse. And mm -hmm. so we can shine our awareness anywhere we want. And most of us on a daily basis, just let the lighthouse go around like a lighthouse goes around. We tune in to something that we need to tune in to because it's either important, it's urgent, it's fearful. Uh, but then we just go back to autopilot and we've created habits and maybe those habits are good habits. Maybe those habits aren't some good habits, but that's who we are. Um, and, and then what I lay out through Sam's journal as he kind of shares his journey with you is the steps you need to take to actually control your mind. So, you know, learning what meditation is, learning willpower, learning focus, the, the application of those to get to the place where you can learn to master your mind. So harnessing the mind accordingly and not letting it become haphazard like the light on the lighthouse. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And I mean, which, which is going back to where we started, which is tell people that are listening, David, like, I mean, I know, I know when I meditate, sometimes I'm really, really good. Sometimes I'm horrible. <laughs> sometimes I've got, everything's running through my mind. What are some of the good little steps that you might be able to share with, uh, some of the listeners about things that they could, if, if, they're, if they're really struggling with it. Yeah, no, for sure. I, you know, I started tinkering with meditation when I was probably 17 or 18 and I read a book on uh, Shambhala and it was this idea of Nirvana, but the book, you know, the book was, uh, it just basically said, empty your mind and then a thought will pop in. Mm -hmm. And I tried it and it was so hard because it's so hard to empty your mind, your, your mind, there's always chatter going on. Mm -hmm. And so as my understanding of what meditation was evolved, it's really about, it's not, meditation is intense focus. Mm -hmm. That's what people don't realize. It's intense focus because what you want to do is that's the, the art and practice of meditation is guiding your mind to stay present on something. And whether that's gathering your energy up from all your limbs and bringing it into your heart or bringing it into your chakras and thinking about determination or thinking about dedication or thinking about something that you want your body to imbue um, and then releasing the energy back into the limbs. And then as you kind of go further down the meditation practice, you start looking at the higher level chakra, the chakras, you know, the heart chakra, the throat chakra, into the head, the crown. Um, and that's the path where you open your third eye. And that's not, that's not conjecture. That's not, you know, hearsay, that's something that people can actually do. And once you open your third eye, then you get to the path where you know what you realize, okay, the mind is a memory mm -hmm. and, and emotion is the language of the mind. Thought is the language, or I'm sorry, emotion is the language of the body. Thought is the language of the mind. Right. So if you open your third eye, you, you begin to get to the place where you can then create a new mind and thereby come back to a new body. And that's, that's the piece that you want to build. So it's, I, I would say, I think to bro boil it down simply, guided meditation I think works best mm -hmm. because it takes you down a path. And if you know where you want to go in your meditation practice, you can find a meditation that's going to take you there. Um, and then you can just go further down the rabbit hole until you get to a place where you realize um, kind of the, the, there's the secret to the universe, the secret to existence is in meditation. Mm -hmm. So it's just practice, take time and, and try to take do it time. as much. Yeah. Just try to do, keep at it, keep at it a bit at a time. It's well, it, it creates a beautiful habit. It creates a beautiful habit because it's an internal journey. And then once you master your mind, you can master yourself. And that's ultimately, that's ultimately the path I think that we all want because ultimately we may call it success. We may call it money. We may call it happiness, but we all want freedom. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what meditation helps provide. And, and what, a, what a need right now with us, you know, having the time to be able to try it. Right. Like, I mean, and you know, I, people will often say, how can I try? I said, just go to, go to instrumental relaxation on YouTube. And, and I say, start, I say to people that are try it for five minutes <laughs> and lots of things are going to happen. Right? But the more that you try it, it gets a little bit easier. Like I do Kundalini yoga. Um, 
Okay. And, you know, to talk about a powerful, I don't even know how to explain it kind of thing. Cause I'm not, I want to talk after yoga. Right. I'm like, okay, can we talk about what's happened here? And they're like, the yogis are looking at me all dressed in white and like, okay, you're not already supposed to talk, but I, I want to talk about my experience when I started it. And then what started to happen was the most powerful things. I had one thing happen. Um, so my grandfather in Trinidad, again, used to plant gardens and he would come and pick us up and we would go help him, you know, as a little child. And I had this Kundalini experience. I had just finished a class. Of course, I'm wanting to talk about it again. Nobody wants to talk to me. So my, my uh, yoga instructor, she always got uh, organic greens. So I took some organic greens and I ate some not thinking anything of it. And I'm going home. Now I'm jumping in my car. I have about 20 minute ride and I'm bawling. I'm now ingested this organic green and something comes over me and all I can think about, and this is what I hear. So I'm thinking either I'm going crazy. This is my thought process or something really freaky is happening. And all I can embody or think about is my, I'm hearing my grandfather's mouth, uh, voice and his words to me is, you are loved and you will always be loved. So I'm like, okay, what's, what's happening here? Like, so obviously, you know, you know, like you said, to your point about the chakras, I had opened up something and me having that um, olfactory or um, gestation of something that brought me in co connection to some part of me that brought that it was powerful. I had to talk about it the next week because I, I had to tell somebody. So, you know, and then, you know, of course, my yoga seat says it's the powerful experience. It's hard to explain what that is other than you've connected at a deeper level. So it, it really um, humbled me. And this is going back about 10, 12 years ago um, where I started to realize, like, when you get into that space, what is possible? Like talking about getting connected to who you are, right? You never know what messages might come. No, well, and that's and that's the that's the surprise. And even uh, this will sound so crazy, but I just within the last probably certainly before this happened, I was on the verge of opening my third eye, and then I did. And and what I found was when you really start to get present, you realize it's it's the law of attraction is absolutely real. What you're seeking is seeking you, and. Mm -hmm everything that you share or everything that you experience is a gift is a message to you i i watched movies that i've watched a dozen times and completely understand the movie now and completely understand it through this movie is a movie about life this is movie is a journey about life it may be about a guy who likes to bowl and you know hang out with his friends but it's a journey about life um, or this movie is a journey about, you know, whatever you put into the universe, once you put it out there, you don't have to worry about how it's going to happen. Because if you worry about how it's going to happen, then you're not letting the universe work its magic. And it's the difference between the known and the unknown. And it's having the courage to be like, you know what, I put this out in the universe. I don't know how it's going to come back to me. I just know it's going to come back. But getting comfortable with that space also. I it's think, it's right? a process. That's a that's certainly a process. In not fact, like I'm... me wanting to talk to all the yogis about what's going on, <laughs> and they kind of look at me and go, "Okay, oh, Roxanne, saying you're not supposed to talk." So I got I got a little bit more comfortable as I went. So I I think uh, tell everybody about uh, any last words. I know I've kept you longer than I thought we were going to talk. Uh, no, any, it's been it's been a treat. Um, any words of wisdom to people that have are listening to this amazing message that you shared today? Anything that you could, anybody listening that's in this time um, that are kind of maybe struggling or wanting to heighten their space in this time, what kinds of words of wisdom would you give them before we go? Yeah. Thank you, Roxanne. First, let me say thank you so much for having me on. It's thank been an absolute here. pleasure. I'm delighted uh, and just to meet you and, and have our conversation. I would say, have the courage to believe and it's not believing in something outside yourself. It's believing in yourself. If you knew with absolute certainty, your life was going to be amazing. How would you behave? Who would you be if you knew that? And that's not something anyone else can tell you. That's something you have to find yourself. But if you believe that, if you know, if you have the certainty that life is going to turn out exactly the way you want it, you can't fail. You can't possibly fail. So Absolutely. that's fine belief, fine belief within yourself. 
Well, thank you so much. So tell everybody where they could uh, get a hold of you if they're wanting to either coach or pick up one of your, of your books. Or I Absolutely. know you, all, also, you also speak up. So where can people reach you? Absolutely. DavidRichardsAuthor.com. Um, the Lighthouse Keeper uh, is available worldwide everywhere now, uh, but I'm on David Richards. Uh, I'm on Instagram, David Richards Author, uh, as well as Twitter. Okay, awesome. So what am I taking away? I'm taking away that um, we're in a, a space of opportunity and a gift, something that, you know, I think of the things that I've always wanted to do and what I've been taking the time to do, you know, I'm always complained about there's a lack of time and things like that. So the things that I'm taking the time to, I'm so feel blessed that I, I have the ability to do that. So my word to you um, is to take that time. Think about, you know, when you look back at this time, say a year or five years from now, what is it that you would have wanted to say that you connected with that this time afforded you to do? So uh, again, this is Roxanne Derhodge. If you're wanting any more information on me, I, I'm a mental health and wellness specialist. I can be reached at roxannederhodge.com. Mm -hmm.